And to help me do this, I'm now joined by a good friend of mine, haven't spoken to him for ages, mind, uh, Brendan Chilton, Labour councillor, because he was former chair of Labour Leave. That's how I know people from the other side. How you doing, Bren? Good morning, Alex. Really lovely to see you. I'm not sure I'm going to be any use in oh, sorting gosh. out your brain nerves. Tom, can mine you help us? <laughs> mine we... is just a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, let's, let's, let's start off with this whole Rwanda thing, Bren, right? Because uh, you and I have uh, had dealings with each other, not just in terms of the world of um, uh, leaving the EU, but we, we, we've had many a conversation, haven't we, twixt us about building relations with Africa. And it was quite interesting when we decided to send a load of money over to Rwanda and said, well, you know, you're trying to build the city of the future in Kigali. You need migrant workers and you'll happily take a lot of young men who want to better their lives and uh, put them in decent accommodation that we paid for and give them jobs and give them the chance to integrate and someone who used to live in East Africa, I think Kigali's a lovely city and Rwanda is a beautiful country. Frankly, better than Britain right now, I'd happily take up the offer. Um, but uh, Sakir Starmer decided to get rid of all of that. And now Joachim Stamp, who's the uh, migration commissioner in Germany, has said, well, if you're not using that accommodation, maybe we could. What do you say to that? Well, I think obviously uh, there needs to be some sort of solution to the, the what seems to be a permanent migrant crisis now facing the country. Obviously, the weather's now turning, so we will expect fewer boats to cross the channel, but they'll be back next spring. Um, I think the, the Rwanda scheme, uh, when it was initiated by the last government, I think I'm right in saying uh, only two people went there and it was sort of in the, the days after the general election. Um, so in terms of its success, it, it didn't actually deliver what the previous government said. I always thought it was a little bit of a gimmick, you know, it sort of had echoes of dispatching people off to the penal colonies, and I just thought that wasn't really the sort of policy that any government in this country should want to adopt. Now, the question, therefore, is if you're not going to have that policy, what policy are you going to have? Because the problem needs to be dealt with. Mm. Um, clearly that we need on this particular issue and i say this as a staunch eurosceptic we need to have that stronger cooperation not just with northern european countries but with southern european countries because that is where the problem enters the well, continent now i'm glad you brought up the southern european countries where the problem enters the continent because i think uh, when you think to the countries where the problem enters the continent one uh, immediately thinks of italy and greece in particular Greece, because they have a land border with Turkey as well as uh, sea borders. Um, and uh, a little bit Spain, actually, you get the odd uh, migrant boat bobbing over to the Canary Islands. That's quite a long way to go. And uh, talking about Greece, you know, 850,000 people entered Greece in 2015 alone. 850,000! Enormous! Uh, and yet in 2022, it's down to just over 12,000, Bren. Do you know why? Well, I, I understand, I was listening to you just before we came on air together, that the Greek uh, government did order the turning around of boats. Right. Uh, Seems like to, a good uh, idea. Well, I think, ultimately, this is the only policy that will work. Um, because you can work on trying to find solutions further down the line in Europe, you can work on building safer routes, you can work on having targets and border commands, all that does help. But ultimately, unless a government is prepared to say, do you know what, this is not the correct way to enter our country, we are going to take you back to, in our case, France, or in the Greeks' case, uh, Turkey, you will not get that deterrent because the vicious people that smuggle these people across the continent will find alternative ways. Until we get to that point where we are prepared to say, no, enough is enough, um, we are, frankly, going to have uh, an ongoing migration problem. Yeah, infinity migration, as, as I heard someone calling it the other day. Let's uh, turn our attention now to GB Energy. I mean, first of all, what even is it? What is it? I mean, what, is this a nationalised energy company that's going to, what, do one of those big children in need charity checks over to Beijing to build wind-woms and solar panels and stuff, and, and we're going to pay for it, and yet it's supposed to not cost us money, it's supposed to save us money? Well, I think um, this initiative by Ed Miliband and the Labour government, the whole purpose of it is to try and make the United Kingdom more energy secure and more energy resilient. Now, of course, the transition to net zero is not going to be achieved 
overnight. You can't just click your fingers and all of a sudden oil and gas is gone and we're all living in wind turbine land. As far as I understand, as I say, GB uh, Energy is what seems to be a sort of investment uh, bank at the moment where it's going to be investing in green technologies. I'd like to see that technology and industry being invested in here in the UK. Uh, because it seems to me to be rather ludicrous to be uh, trying to build energy resilience in our own economy, but we're dependent on imports uh, for that uh, energy security from abroad. Yeah, um, I want to draw down onto that. Uh, mind's the pun there. Um, <laughs> because uh, when, it, when it comes to, uh, you know, making us more energy secure by cutting us off from the teat of fossil fuel, where we have been reliant upon, um, well, we weren't so much reliant upon Russia, other elements of the wholesale energy markets were, looking at you, Germany. But uh, most recently it's been Qatar, uh, LNG, and um, oil prices, OPEC, the lot of it. Um, you'd say, well, okay, we don't have uh, much of the black stuff, although we do, uh, so one would assume that would have been a good route to go down, but no, Ed Miliband decided to cancel any future contracts for drilling of North Sea oil and gas. So instead we're going to make ourselves more secure by having green energy. But the problem is that also relies upon getting stuff out of the ground that we don't have access to and we don't have control of. I don't see how the argument is different when, frankly, we need a whole load of rare earth minerals uh, in order to turbo boost um, the, the, the net zero targets. And... The, the people who own 99% now of rare earth minerals are China and actually increasingly Russia who are all up in Africa sniffing around lithium mines and the like and even then if you wanted to get enough stuff out of the ground for project net zero car batteries and all the rest of it you'd have to build about 80 super mines every single year um, it's, it's going to be a finite resource pretty much like oil and gas isn't it and it's a finite resource in the hands of ne'er-do-well hostile foreign states so how is that different from fossil I, fuels I, I don't disagree with you uh, Alex and the the other aspect of this as well which is slightly worse is that the extraction of those rare earth materials in many African countries is usually done by women young women and children because yeah. they're small enough uh, to fit it a bit like when we used to mine coal back in the day the, the little people are sent down because they can get into the tunnels to extract this stuff uh, and it's absolutely horrific some of the conditions those children operate under but you are right that the broad principle is the same we are still extracting from mother earth materials that we need uh, to ensure our energy uh, continues. Now, I think it's far better, uh, especially as us as an island nation, and let's be honest, we are a small country relative to others, and in t years to come, uh, there will be other countries in the world with much, much bigger economies than we have, including many in the east of Asia, and indeed uh, in parts of uh, Latin America. So we need to make sure we make the right decisions now for our own energy security. And while I support the overall uh, ambition for us to become uh, a net zero economy we've got to be realistic about the speed at which we can do it and so to cancel the exploration of any further oil and uh, oil and uh, gas in the north sea i think was a mistake by the government uh, because as keir starmer said oil and gas is going to be here for a long time yet to come and so we should be using those resources under the ground similarly uh, we should be uh, utilising British natural shale gas, mm. uh, just as the Biden administration in America uh, had done in the past few years. Um, I think what needs to happen, though, uh, looking at our wider position in the world, while respecting where we are, we have kind of abandoned our own interests in Africa and in parts of the developing world. And that void has been filled, as you and I both know, uh, by Russia and by China. And this is a very unsettling set of circumstances to be in, because as you just highlighted, they now have got 90% of all rare earth materials. It's 99, isn't it? I think 90 yes, would be... Uh... Yeah, I think it's about an something, isn't it, from my last thing? But it, it's it's a terrifying position to be mm. in. Uh, there should be British companies in there. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, aid cuts combined with our failure to grow our economy over the last 15 years has meant uh, that our limitations are now really quite profound. Brendan, has anyone ever told you you're in the wrong party? <laughs> no, uh, they have, but I think... Uh, <laughs> The Labour Party itself, it's, it's, you know, it's been in for two months. Uh, we have to measure what the government does uh, over time. But I hope 
the Foreign Secretary and the Chancellor are very much awake to these issues because if we fail to grow our economy, and part of that is energy security, it's securing our position around the world. If we fail to do that, the next election is not certain. I know it's, I know it's five years off, but the outcome is by no means certain. Growth is key, and to do that, we need to reconsider some of those early decisions we've made. Ben, it's been great speaking to you. And let's catch up again soon. It's been a while. Brendan Chilton there, who's a Labour Leave and a Labour councillor, sounding very much like someone who doesn't agree with much of what the Labour Party says and does.